So what I want to do is just say, let me tell you what happened to me. I really, when Stanley Harawa said that about the experience of being forgiven, because I'm going to take you with me into experiences of death row and people being executed and over to the side of murder victims' families. And, and the basic journey is going to be both arms of the cross. And we have in the scriptures this week, Holy Week, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. And the cruciform image of the lethal injection gurney is in fact cruciform. And we are piercing people and killing them. And we're good people. We, the American people, are good people. How could it happen that a good people like us, that have kind hearts and are generous, could be having this kind of official death take place, often with blessing from the community of faith, that Christians did not raise our voices strongly in the beginning? This has been going on for 30 years. So when Stanley was talking about, because we have the experience of being forgiven, it's the way I want to talk about grace, that grace wakes us up. Grace awakened me. I was 40 years old before I began to understand that the gospel of Jesus was calling me not just simply to be kind and to be charitable and to pray for people, but to roll up my sleeves and be there and be a servant and go cross boundaries to people who were struggling and poor and of whom I was afraid. I grew up in privilege. I grew up as a young girl in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, during the days of Jim Crow, and the only African Americans I ever knew personally were Ellen, who worked in the house with Mama, and Jesse, who worked in the yard. I didn't even know their last names. So I went to a private girls school, all white, Sacred Heart Church, African-American people had to sit in a special place in the church. When it came time for our first communion in which we experienced in a sacrament how we are all one body, black kids had to receive their Holy Communion separately. And I never questioned it. And that is what culture does. Culture gives us eyes, ears, well, honey, it's better that the races stay separate in the South, otherwise they'll be fighting. And they like to be with their own kind, and we like to be with our own kind. And so to awaken to the gospel call to justice was grace. I didn't wake myself up. I didn't wake, we can't wake ourselves up. God wakes us up. Grace means that we awaken because we can't make ourselves be enlightened. We go in a little cave for 10 years, do a little press conference before we go in and announce that we're going to fast. And well, we can announce that we're going to come out skinnier, but we cannot announce <laughs> that we're going to come out enlightened. We can't wake ourselves up to that. I, I, it was very telling when Stanley said this. We need another to tell us our sin. I mean, because we're always always searching, always going, what Lord, what, what next? To be human is to search. To be human is to have this infinite capacity to want to know truth and to love. And we're never going to stop doing that. So let me tell you what happened to me. This book right here is about God waking me up and where it took me, all right? It's eyewitness account, eyewitness let me tell you what happened to me. And when we share our faith journey with each other, that's all we're doing, is saying, let me tell you what happened to me and how God woke me up and how through community I awaken. And I'm gonna take you here into this journey with me and we're gonna go to both arms of the cross. The perpetrator on one arm who did an unspeakable act and how can we talk with that person? How, how can we possibly deal with that person as someone who deserves our dignity, their dignity, but much less our love? And on the other hand, the victim's family, who wake up one morning and it's an ordinary day and before the sun sets, 
they have been plunged into unbelievable violence and tragedy that is going to mar their lives for the rest of their lives. And in a country that says the way we're going to deal with violent offenses, there are some people who have done murders that are so bad, the worst of the worst, the Supreme Court has called them. The worst of the worst, that it is okay. In fact, it's acceptable that we'll set up a process to discern and sift out the worst of the worst and to kill them. How can this be happening to us and that we have allowed it? You live in California, and if you're a resident of California, your state has 744 human beings in death row cages tonight. The largest death row in the United States. They've all been condemned to death. And we as citizens and as residents of this state cannot say we're neutral about that because if we are not resisting it, if we are not working to change it, we are complicit. If we are silent about it, we are complicit because we are a democracy and we cannot say some authoritarian government suddenly put that in place and we had nothing to do with it. So it's all about this journey and about this waking up. So what happened to me was coming out of this place of privilege, going to private Catholic schools, going to Notre Dame University in the summer and studying theology. I studied scripture, I studied theology. But the waking up, and I take you into that in the first part of this book, and it was, I heard a talk. How many times had I gone to conferences and heard talks? And we never know when it's gonna be the moment that the spirit is gonna strike fire in our hearts and awaken us. And that's the first part that I began to realize out of that talk that Jesus calls us to go to the margins, to cross the boundaries. I was working in a Catholic parish in New Orleans, out in the suburbs with good people. St. Francis Cabrini, we were doing good stuff. We were learning scripture, we were learning really good stuff. And we had in the inner city of New Orleans over 50% of, of, of our residents of New Orleans, African-American people who were living in poverty and were having experiences, you'd see, you'd get glimmers on the news. But I had never gone to those places. I would never gone to be with people. And when I awakened, I moved into the St. Thomas Housing Projects and lo and behold, other people had been awake long before me, and I moved in there with four nuns. We were the only white people in St. Thomas Housing Projects, and I sat at the feet of African-American people to become my teachers about the America I had never known. My daddy was a lawyer. My daddy had resources. My daddy knew judges. My daddy was a great businessman in Baton Rouge. I didn't know what it was to ever walk in a room and just have people look at me funny because of the color of my skin. They might disagree with me because they would disagree politically or whatever. And I began to learn. And I'm still so grateful to be awake that I, that I awakened and that the people taught me. I learned every young black man at a community meeting talked about what had happened to them with the police. I wasn't scared of the police. If, if my car had broken down on the highway in Louisiana and the state troop had pulled up behind me, I'd say, oh, good, there's help. Every young man in that community had had bad experiences with the police. I went to good schools. And when you get educated, then your gifts are honed and developed so that you can become an agent of persuasion and change in the community, you can make things happen. Kids were coming into our adult learning center who had gotten as far as their junior year in high schools in the public schools in New Orleans. I was always part of the Catholic private school system. And here comes a kid. Well, how far did you get? Well, I was a junior. Well, look, you're going to get your GED. We're going to work with you individually in your reading, in your math. And he couldn't read a third grade reader. 
what's going to happen to an African-American kid who gets out of high school and can't read? What's going to happen to him? And it's not that I was so virtuous. I was so blooming protected and cushioned and resourced. Young girls coming in had a baby by the time they were 14 or 15 years old. Going to charity hospitals to sit with people because they don't have health care. Louis, my little brother, almost died when he was six months old, but Mama had gone to nursing school in Our Lady of the Lake in Baton Rouge, and she knew the doctors. And they got Louis, and Louis got good medical help, and it saved his life. And here I go with Geraldine Johnson with her shivering kid, high with fever, and sits in a plastic chair in Charity Hospital and waits till a young intern from LSU Medical School is going to come and call her at 2 o'clock in the morning and take her kid because she didn't have health care. I never knew. I, I knew in general that things were like this. But it was the experiencing of the suffering and seeing a system that caused the suffering and that I couldn't just be neutral. Rilke, the German poet, said, more is required than being swept along. And I awaken to that mother in that charity hospital and to those kids that were going to public schools because they didn't have a choice. They couldn't go to St. Mary's Dominican. They couldn't go to St. Joseph Academy. And the passage in scripture that became very, very special to me and still is, is Moses and that burning bush. Let me go see the bush that burns and yet doesn't seem to be consumed or burnt up. And the first voice coming from the heart of God in, in Revelation and Exodus, he gets close and the voice says, I have heard the cry of my people. It took me a long time to hear the cry of the people in my own country and the suffering. And they took me by the hand and they taught me. And it's while I was there in the St. Thomas Housing Projects working at a place called Hope House where I come out to St. Andrew Street and here comes a friend who worked in the Louisiana Prison Coalition office. And if I don't even know what's happening with half of the city of my brothers and sisters in New Orleans, you know I don't know what's going on in prisons. I'd never been to a prison, are you kidding me? A prison. And he sees me, and I want to introduce an idea here into this wonderful place, that Jesus is sneaky. <laughs> I mean, sneaky Jesus. I want to talk about sneaky Jesus in two parts. Two parts. And here's Sneaky Jesus part one. Here comes Chava Cola, and this is the way the book opens. Hey, Sister Helen, he had a little clipboard. He had a little project going. Anybody he sees is going to ask you to be part of that project. He goes, hey, Sister Helen, you want to be a pen pal, somebody on death row here in Louisiana? And I was learning about all the social justice issues. I said, yeah. I was an English major. I could write some nice letters to that person. <laughs> I didn't think they were going to kill this person. We hadn't had an execution in 20 years. There had been an unofficial moratorium on the death penalty in the United States. And, and in Louisiana, too, in the Deep South states, which, by the way, have done 7.5%, 75% of all executions. The real executioners in the United States are the 10 southern states that practice slavery. And boy, your little sociological minds can just start making all the connections. <laughs> and eight out of every 10 people that are sitting on death row considered the worst of the worst are there because they kill white people, even though the majority of homicide victims in this country are people of color. If your life doesn't matter, you're not outraged over somebody's death that you're going to seek the ultimate punishment. It's lives have to have status. Black lives matter? Boy, doubly. True. But when you're killed, 90% of all the homicide victims in New Orleans are people of color, are often young men killing other young men, and you never see a DA seek the death penalty. So, hey, Sister Helen, 
You want to be a pen pal? I say, sure. Give me the name Patrick Sonier. It's the first story in this book. I write the man a letter. You know what the problem was? He wrote back. <laughs> and he's telling me about life in a six and a half foot, I mean, yeah, foot cell by eight and a half feet. And I'm telling him about Hope House. And it all unfolded the way God's spirit works with us. I want to talk about a flower opening. It was gentle. It wasn't this big dramatic thing. I'm going to go to death row. I'm going to be the death row nun. Uh, <laughs> You know, it all unfolds, it unfolds. I write, he writes, and then from his letters, I knew he didn't have anyone to come visit him. He didn't even ask me to come. But how many times, how many retreats had I made? How much scripture had I studied where I'd read the words of Jesus? I was in prison, and you came to me. And boy, you know, we are our own spin doctors with these scriptures. Because every time I come to those words, I just go, oh, well, you know, there's a lot of ways of being in prison. You know, like you shy. I mean, really, like if you're shy and you come in a big group of people like you in prison, I mean, you know, you don't know how to do it. I never dreamed the words meant I was in prison. And you came to me. So I write to him and we've begun to... The encounter happened through the letters. Any encounter, Pope Francis is trying to teach us that. Encounter, get out of the comfortable place. Go to where the people are. Let the encounter happen, and the Spirit then leads us in that. And so I wrote to him. It was a simple little note. I just said, I'll come see you sometimes. And here's Sneaky Jesus part two. Because immediately in the return mail, visit to farms, you'll come see me. And he said simply, well, look, I'm a Catholic, you're a nun, will you be my spiritual advisor? All right, sure, man, I'll fill out the form. I got no felonies, send it in. <laughs> and I don't know that two years from the time I write that letter to him, I'm going to, the only one who can be with a person who's being executed is a spiritual advisor. And that at quarter to, it's going to happen at midnight in the electric chair, and at quarter to six, everybody's got to leave the death house except the spiritual advisor, who's going to be me. We have a spiritual maxim in our community that says, never leap ahead of grace. The grace comes into us, and we move with the grace. Kind of like the way if you've ever seen a ship in locks, the water's at different levels. The ship goes into the locks. The water comes up, and then you move. And that's what that experience was in that death house with that man. What had he done? I came to it late. He and his brother had killed two teenage kids. And at first, when I was writing the book, I downplayed that I didn't reach out to the victim's family because I had never done it before and I said I didn't know what to do with victim's family. And I had a great editor. I've only worked with great Jewish editors <laughs> at Random House for both of these books. And when he looks at the first draft of Dead Man Walking, he said, Helen, that was a bad mistake. And you wait far too long in the way you write your story about taking people in to stand in the presence of this crime where two innocent teenage kids are found shot in the back of the head and left in the sugar cane field. And if you don't bring people over to both sides of this struggle and face the crime and the outrage that you feel early in the book, nobody's going to read your book because they're going to say, well, she's a Catholic nun, she's a spiritual advisor, she believes in the forgiveness of Jesus. And they're going to think you're not going to take them there. They're going to think you can't face the horror and the outrage of what was done, that you're going to be so overly sympathetic for the human rights of the perpetrator who did it. And you never would have heard of this book if I hadn't had that editor to help me shape that story. And he said, your task is in writing this story stand in the outrage about those kids and then gradually take the reader with you into what it means to strap in a human being in an electric chair and take that person's life. 
that's the journey of the book. It's your own journey, and it's the journey that, that you take people with you on. And the hero of this book is not me. I'm the storyteller because I didn't reach out to the victim's family. And when I did meet them, it was at a pardon board hearing where the victim's family had packed in to say to the pardon board appointed by the governor, we want to see the execution proceed because they've been told this is the way you get justice for your dead child. And that's when I met the victim's families who were angry at me because I had done nothing to reach out to them. I had done it all wrong. But this man, Lloyd LeBlanc, whose son David had been killed, he reached out to me and he said, Sister Helen, all this time you've been visiting with those two brothers and you didn't come see us. Sister, you can't believe the pressure on us with this death penalty. And I haven't had anybody to talk to. Come pray with me. And that man took me into his heart and into his journey. And he said, pressure on me. What I meant was everybody was saying to me, Lloyd LeBlanc, you got to be for the death penalty or it looked like you didn't love your boy. And he said, I had nobody, no, I had nobody to talk to to say, no, that's not the way of Jesus. And you know that's not what it is in your own heart. I had nobody. And sister, you weren't there for me either. So he said, with all those people telling me that, he said, I went there. I pictured pulling the switch on both these brothers that had done this. And I wanted them to feel the pain because of, look at the pain that was in our family. And he said, but then I began to discover what was happening to me. And then finally he put his hand out like this and he said, uh-uh, they killed our boy, but I'm not going to let all that hate that was coming into me, kill me. I'm going to do what Jesus said. And he set his face to go down the road of forgiveness. It's not a one-act deal. Oh, I forgive. It's a road. It's a journey into forgiveness. He was the first victim's family that I ever met. And I've been many now along the way. But he was the first that showed me that what forgiveness is, is not so much or primarily relieving the burden of the one who hurt you, but it was saving his own life. Four, give. God's loving grace to keep love intact so that hatred did not overcome him and he would lose his own life too. A profound journey. And that's why I say he's the hero. I'm the storyteller. And I'm still learning. Still learning. Always will be learning. But I'm awake. I'm awake. And what's important is not when we wake up. It's what we do after we wake up. And when we begin to act, it's liberating to act. The hardest part is, well, shall I do this or shall I do that? Well, I'm in discernment for this. Well, maybe I could do that. Oh, it's very complex. There are a lot of causes in the world. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? <laughs> Just put your hand on the rope and start pulling. Put your hand on the rope, the life rope, and start pulling, and grace comes in and then reveals the next steps. So I encourage you, I want to invite you to come into the journey with me by reading these books. The second one is The, the Death of Innocence, and it talks about the dialogue we have had in the Catholic Church, including with the Pope, to, for us as Catholics to take a strong stand that what Jesus is about is all about forgiveness and love and integrity not being overcome by hatred, much less having the government legitimize it through law or, re or religion legitimize it by their selective, our selective quoting of the scriptures that God wants this. God wants people to pay for their sins by dying for their sins. And God wants pain for pain and li life for life. What kind of God is that? Is that the God of Jesus? And so it's a journey for all of us. And I'm really, really glad that I could be here with you and share this with you. It is a joy to be in your presence and I'm leaving out of here more alive than when I came. Thank you.